January 1st, 2023, police say the driver of a red car went past flashing police lights and a tow truck. Officers pull the driver over and then attempt to get both the driver and the passenger, Kaylin Smart, out of the car. Here's what happens next. Why are you opening the door like that? You went through an accident scene no, and I you get another no. car. Shut your mouth. No, you shut, shut your mouth. mouth. Shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. The passenger does not listen to orders to get out of the car, and then the Toledo police officers, Ashlyn Plot and Adam Hobbs, you take action. Step out. Officer Hobbs pulls the woman out of the car and then wrestles with her. Out of the car. According to a police report, Officer Hobbs used joint manipulation and strikes to try to get smart under control. They eventually get her handcuffed. And then you see the driver get out of the car. It appears she has her cell phone in her hand. The driver also struggles with police. She's handcuffed and police say she's pulling away, pushing and kicking the officer. While handcuffed, the officer uses what Toledo police call hair head control techniques. Then it appears the female officer pulls the woman to the ground and punches her five times. Both the driver and the passenger were arrested and charged. But it doesn't end there. Smart filed a lawsuit in district court against the city of Toledo and the two officers who responded to that call. She claims her civil rights were violated, she was assaulted, and her arrest was unlawful. After months of back and forth, there's a deal with the law department proposing a $50,000 settlement paid to the passenger in the car that night. Now, the city of Toledo denied the allegations made in court and says the officer's actions did not violate any constitutional rights. As for Officer Pluff and Officer Hobbs, there was an internal investigation by Toledo police that found that Officer Pluff violated the department's policy on demeanor and Hobbs violated the policy on demeanor and unnecessary use of physical techniques. Officer Pluff suspended for a day while Officer Rahab, Hobbs, that is, received a 20-day suspension, including 10 days without pay and a verbal reprimand. Now, the case against the city is still pending in district court. Today, the I-Team reached out to the attorneys for the woman behind this lawsuit. We're still waiting to hear back. Good morning and welcome to the Bad Apple Report. It's 7.30 a.m., bright and early right here at Home on the Range. Thank you so much for being here today, folks. You know, I really appreciate it. We've got so many bad apples to get to. Let's get right on with the show. We have a Rush County deputy charged with pointing a gun at a person. A Rush County Sheriff's deputy has been officially charged with two criminal misdemeanors after allegedly pointing a firearm at someone. The Sheriff's Department confirmed that Deputy Bobby Peck of Moreland is charged with pointing an unloaded firearm at another person and criminal recklessness, both misdemeanors. What's that unloaded thing all about? The Sheriff's Department also confirmed that Sheriff Alan Rice is aware of the allegations made against Peck and the criminal charges. Due to the nature of it being an ongoing investigation, Sheriff Rice is not releasing a statement at this time. The Sheriff's Department said in a statement, well, that was a statement. Peck's current employment status with the Sheriff's Department was not disclosed. Council, County Council records indicate that Peck joined the Sheriff's Department in 2022 after completing his training at a law enforcement academy. Oh, those law enforcement academies. What are they teaching those guys in that academy? Holy beam is guy down right here. HBD surrounded him on Lique Lique Highway near Kahikili just after noon yesterday. We have confirmed that the suspect is a 46-year-old man. He was also booked for a resisting arrest, failing to stop, and a drug offense. Charges are pending. He also had an outstanding $30,000 warrant. We reached out to HPD to find out why the officers used force, and we're still waiting to hear back. And we're banging through some headlines. Like you know what we got to do. This Martin County deputy was arrested for stalking, hmm, says the sheriff. A Martin County deputy was arrested on a warrant Friday, according to the sheriff's office. Yurandi Cairo, 26, was booked on five counts of loitering or prowling and one count of misdemeanor stalking. <laughs> according to the Martin County Sheriff's Office, it received information from the Stewart Police Department on Thursday stating that one of their off-duty deputies was being warned for trespassing. Cairo was placed on administrative leave the following day. MCSO set forth an internal affairs investigation. MCSO said they will not be releasing any further information about the victim because of Marcy's law. According to the information provided by MCSO, Cairo was hired 
on February 23rd, 2022. Oh, and later in the year, he attended a law enforcement academy before being sworn in as a deputy sheriff. Oh, I wonder what they taught him in that academy. For each count of wire fraud, he faces up to 20 years in prison, up to three years of supervised release, up to a $250,000 fine. Um, in terms of for false statement count, the one Joe says, it's, that's a tough one. Um, for a defense attorney to beat, Vappi faces up to five years in prison, up to three years of supervised release, up to a $250,000 fine, and a $100 mandatory special assessment. And I remember for Comfrey federal, federal Court, when you lie to an FBI agent, it is hard for you to beat that. And correct me if I'm wrong, Joe, it's because it's their word for the most part right, when I was that the jury always absolutely. takes. No matter, even if you don't have, I've seen cases where I've covered in federal court, they didn't have the paperwork to back up, but still they cited they, the okay, federal government. Well, this is what, and I learned this uh, as a young lawyer, came out of the DA's office in Orleans Parish, started doing federal work, and they came in and wanted to interview a client. I said, well, are you going to be recording this? And he said, no. I said, well, then I, I'll record it. They said, no. Okay, so there is no recording by, by intent. They generate what are called 302s. And based upon what they represent in their 302s, you can be charged with this and very well get charged with this. And uh, sometimes it can, these things, don't look at those statutory maximums. The things you need to look at are statutory, mandatory minimums sometimes, which I believe this could yeah. carry. I would uh, keep your TV on. Time-wise, do you think we'll see more indictments within two months? That's tough to speculate. It could come as early as next Friday. It could be four months from now. The dates in this particular scheme are not that old. So you have a false statement in 2023. You have a time frame that runs in the least the scheme from 2021 to 2024 up to date. So there's, there's no particular time pressure uh, to indict or seek other charges against other people based on the information here. Now, we don't know what other schemes exist and what other time considerations are there. But as far as what we see here on this indictment, um, there's no particular time pressure that I see. The mayor is listed as public official one in this, not indicted, not accused of any wrongdoing, but definitely at least implicated for what the feds say was a romantic involvement with Jeffrey Vapia. Yeah, one of the things that stands out about this indictment is the information that relates to um, former interim superintendent of the NOPD, Michelle Woodfork. Um, and, and there's suggestions in the indictment. Um, well, we know there were disciplinary actions that were taken against um, Jeffrey Vapi in 2023, um, internal Public Integrity Bureau um, disciplinary actions. Um, that were the result of his time cards that he submitted. Um, it appears from the indictment that um, when Superintendent Woodfork advised the mayor that she was planning to sustain those disciplinary actions, um, that at that point, Jeffrey Vappi attempted to influence that decision. Um, the indictment alleges that he contacted um, Michelle Woodfork, that he tried to talk to her about it, asked her to quote unquote, make it right. Um, and that he also, um, you know, met up with her or tried to meet up with her at a daiquiri shop to discuss the findings of that investigation. Um, the other thing that's significant is that it's, you know, it's sometime after that that Mayor Cantrell made the decision not to give Michelle Woodfork the job as permanent uh, chief of the New Orleans Police Department, but instead gave that job to another candidate. And so the implication potentially is that Michelle Woodfork may also be someone who's cooperating with the federal government um, in developing this case. Talk about how that would work, how the conversations would go to our viewers, kind of explain how that would work if, if she has been um, speaking with investigators. Yeah, I mean, you know, these federal prosecutors and the agents investigating these cases are, are extremely diligent. And so they'll reach out to anyone that they think may have information um, to request voluntary interviews. Um, people have the option to come in and voluntarily provide information to law enforcement. Um, they can, you know, come in with lawyers. Um, but some of the information in the indictment at least suggests that um, the federal uh, investigators may have gotten information from uh, Michelle Woodfork about that. And we were speaking a moment ago, there's some additional information kind of deeper in the document. What is your take on that aspect that we were speaking on? Sure. I, I mean, the timeline, you know, lays out pretty clearly um, that there was an internal investigation into Jeffrey Vappi about, you know, allegedly submitting false time cards um, that sometime after that, 
uh, Michelle Woodfork indicated she was going to sustain the, the findings, the disciplinary action, um, and that after Vappi's alleged unsuccessful attempts to change her mind, um, that Mayor Cantrell made the decision uh, not to not to give her the job as police chief. And, and what's interesting is that they note that at the meeting where that's discussed with the mayor and, and Woodfork, that Vappi was actually present for that meeting. Um, now, whether he's there in his official capacity as her executive protection um, or for some other purpose, you know, is an open question. But that is, it, it's something to note. And uh, also important to note at this time, Mayor Cantrell is not specifically listed in any of the documents as we're going through her name, correct? Her That's name not. does her name does not appear. That's exactly right. They refer to her as a public official one. Um, you can tell from the context that public official one is the mayor, um, but her name is not mentioned and she is not charged with any crimes. Right. Very important note, Sarah. I appreciate your time. Well, what has this modern fellow gotten himself into? Hmm. Attempt to influence a public servant, false reporting, tampering with physical evidence. What is the deal with this loose cannon from Cannon City? Florence police officer arrested by Cannon City Police Department. Oh. The Cannon City Police Department arrested a 27-year-old Florence police officer on several charges. Hmm, several. CCPD says that after a lengthy investigation and consultation with the district attorney's office of the 11th Judicial District, CCPD detectives got an arrest warrant charging... Oh, that person goes by Emily Bailey with the following charges. I'm sorry, Emily. I just thought nowadays with the lax standards, they let you grow your hair long. They let people wear sleeve tattoos and teardrop tattoos and stuff. <laughs> Cops are funny. So on June 18th, 2024, Bailey filed a report with the Cannon City police officers alleging her spouse had committed several domestic violence related offenses. Hey. She's mad at him. During the investigation into the allegations, CCPD says the officers received and then looked into some inconsistent statements prompting further investigation. Inconsistent statements from a cop? Come on. Search warrants were issued by the courts to examine the content of both phones that belonged to Bailey and her spouse and obtain evidence supporting the belief that Bailey had not provided all the relevant information to officers about the incident between her and her spouse. You shouldn't be lying to cops. They don't like that. After reviewing all the evidence in the case and consulting with the district attorney's office, detectives sought an arrest warrant charging Bailey. After determining that, the, that Bailey would face criminal charges, Florence Police Chief Sean Humphrey was notified of the potential wrongdoing. Mm. FPD says that Bailey is on administrative leave. They also said the city is aware of this matter. However, it is the city's policy not to comment on pending personnel matters. FPD clarified that these allegations are of a private nature and are not related to the employee's official duties or work with the city. Well, no, but she did lie to a cop, and that's officially uncool. And I think it's a crime. Well, today, prosecutors called Todd Burnham a predator and say his actions span decades, but the defense says he is maintaining his innocence. Todd Burnham was convicted of 15 counts of possessing child sex abuse images, but prosecutors say they found thousands of images and videos on devices in his home and that his search history reflects searching for the content. But the defense says he's innocent, making it clear he's only been charged with 15 counts of possession, not thousands. Now, Burnham did address the judge today. He spoke to him about his upbringing and what becoming an EMT meant for him. His lawyers tell the court that he has no past convictions, and this is the first time he's ever been to jail, and he's already spent nearly 1,000 days there. The prosecutors asked for 40 to 90 years after hearing testimony from the four women who have come forward saying they were sexually assaulted by Burnham. He is facing a separate trial for those charges. The defense says at 50 years old, this sentence is essentially a life sentence. And what I have here before me is significant compelling evidence of decades of grooming and manipulating and taking pictures of or possessing pictures of um, young women in, in sex acts. And most of the images that, that I saw at trial, um, behind every one of those images is, is a child rape. Um, and I'm, I'm convinced that you committed. 
And Judge Ruoff sentenced him to 50 years before even being eligible for parole. The judge says he does not sentence like this usually, but he felt it was his duty to protect the community. Live in Brentwood, Kelly O'Brien, WMUR. You can see this white vehicle is our suspect pulling up to the front of the sheriff's office. This is not a normal parking spot. You'll see shortly here Miss Carter exit her vehicle and the citizen that was in the parking lot will come out of this van and approach her. This is the citizen walking up to the front of the sheriff's office to press that intercom button to report the confrontation he just had with the female. This is a citizen coming back from reporting her. It's at this time that the sheriff and Deputy Kleinage realize that there's some type of disturbance going on. They come out of the office door there to investigate the disturbance and confront the female. As you can see, Ms. Carter is still armed with the, the gun and a knife. Both are giving commands to drop the weapons. Deputy Kleinage is on the right. This is where Deputy Kleinage attempts to tase Ms. Carter. The taser wires are out. Clearly the taser had no effect. And that's the end of the tape that we're releasing. And that's it for today, folks. Thank you so much for sticking around to watch the Bad Apple Report this morning and every morning right here at home on the range. You are the very best. And I'm going to whip up another batch of Bad Apples for you. And we'll see you back here at 7.30 a.m. bright and early. Have a great day, folks. Thank <laughs> you.